Good morning, and thank you for having me here. We started with a very simple question. Could we recreate one of Hollywood's scariest villains, the T-1000? Well, no, not really. That's not exactly how it worked, but that's what I hope to show you. Um, the T-1000, in case you haven't heard of it, was the villain in the movie Terminator 2, which aired in the 1990s. The T-1000 is composed of this special, fictitious material called mimetic polyalloy, which has these special properties that allow it to shapeshift and also self-heal in response to mechanical damage. In short, it seems impervious to damage. And so, in case you haven't seen the movie, I'd like to quickly show you why this is such a special material and why we would want to try to replicate it. The T-1000 in this scene has seemingly been destroyed by the former governor of California <laughs> and has unfortunately turned into little liquid metal droplets that come back together and reassemble and turn back into the T-1000. And when you see this, it's quite obvious that you're watching science fiction. First of all, there's no good way to turn metals into humans, and that's a problem I'm not quite yet equipped to, to solve. But in addition, there's some more basic uh, physical principles that seem to be violated here. Liquid is flowing up against gravity, and also the liquid is assuming a shape, a human-like shape, that would not normally be possible due to surface tension. Uh, there's a reason that we never see water in the shape of a cone or in the shape of a cylinder, and that's because it's not energetically favorable. Surface tension causes liquids generally to as assume spherical or hemispherical shapes. And we would basically like to emulate these aspects of the T-1000. Now, our goal is not to make a villain. We actually have uh, benevolent, benevolent um, motivations here. We would like to take materials, namely liquid metals, and sort of shape them at our will. And there's a number of reasons you would like to do this. And the, the essence of it is this principle that shape defines function. As a very sort of trivial, trivial example, imagine the difference between a nail and a hammer. They're both made out of metals, but they have very different functions just on the way that they're shaped. And so we're particularly interested in electronics and this idea of making circuits that could reconfigure or change their shape. And so I'm going to give you a few examples today. Now, uh, we go back to Hollywood sort of as a starting point, and I actually had the privilege of talking to Gene Warren Jr., who, who rightfully received an Academy Award for his work on the special effects for this movie. And sure enough, he started with the most famous liquid metal that everybody knows, which is mercury, and then he used computer rendering to take that mercury and, and shape it into the T-1000. And so, as you may recall from freshman chemistry, mercury is just straight off the periodic table, it's over here, uh, right next to gold. And uh, mercury has a couple of applications in our day-to-day -day lives. It's used in thermometers, although it's not so common anymore. And it's also used in fluorescent bulbs. But people generally want to avoid mercury because it is toxic. This is sort of a, a well-known thing going back to the, the Mad Hatter. And so we looked elsewhere on the periodic table. And so if you go to the left side of the periodic table, there is another series of elements, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about them, but to su suffice it to say, these are ones that we wanted to avoid. They're explosively reactive, uh, radioactive in some cases. And so we, by process of elimination, we ended up with gallium. This is the only other material on the periodic table that is a metal and also a liquid at uh, room temperature or near room temperature. Now technically, gallium um, is a solid at room temperature. It melts at about 30 degrees Celsius. This is about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If you were to hold it in your hand, your body temperature would be enough to cause it to melt. But we wanted to ensure it would stay liquid at all times, and so we added in another metal, which is a little bit non-intuitive because this other metal melts at even a higher temperature, and it's called indium. And when you mix these together, you get what's called a eutectic, which allows these things to be a liquid, and they melt at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this is uh, sort of a common everyday principle. If you've, uh, you know, on a, on a snowy day, we often put salt on the roads to keep the water from freezing. And this is the same principle. We're using the indium to depress the melting point and ensure that it stays as a liquid. And so this is, in, very, in many ways, very much like mercury, except it's non-toxic or has low toxicity. It has no vapor pressure, so we don't have to worry about it evaporating. And so we have now our liquid metal. 
But there's something special about this that distinguishes it from mercury and from other metals, or, or from other liquid metals, and that is that it can be patterned. And so in this video, this is a two inch by three inch glass slide, and this video is taken at room temperature, and we're expelling the metal using a syringe just by hand, and you can see right away that it does something interesting, which is that it doesn't bead up like mercury or like a drop of water. In fact, we can sort of paint it onto the surface and make it into a, a non-spherical shape. And just to convince you that it's liquid, if you take this uh, glass slide onto which it's spread, you'll see that the liquid sloshes back and forth, yet it holds its macroscopic shape. And I would say that the punchline for my entire talk, and really uh, the basis for a lot of our research, is the fact that this metal reacts with air, and we talked about the importance of oxygen, this reacts with oxygen to form a very thin oxide skin. And that skin creates a shell into which the liquid metal can slosh back and forth. So you can think about this very much like a waterbed or a water balloon. It's just that this is what Mother Nature gives us, and we're taking advantage of it. And so to convince you of the importance of this oxide skin, which is only about a nanometer thick, that's you know, take your, your hair and divide it into a thousand parts, or take a meter and divide it into a billion parts. It's a very, very small length. And we can remove it using acid. So in this video, we take a Q-tip, dip it in some strong acid, and the vapors from the acid are enough to remove that oxide layer. And without that one nanometer thick oxide layer, the metal beads up, just as you would expect for mercury. So this is the main idea. When we, when we have the, the metal in air, it reacts, it forms a very thin skin, and it gives it remarkable properties. We can also remove it and turn it back into a sort of a regular everyday liquid like you would expect with water or mercury. And so, uh, one of the most interesting things that you can do with this oxide is to 3D print the metal. And so here we've got a syringe and we've got a drop of metal. If we pull the metal back in, you'll see the skin kind of wrinkle up. Um, <clears throat> but this oxide, which forms spontaneously and essentially instantaneously, is strong enough to allow these droplets to be stacked on, on each other, even though they're, they're liquid, just like water, and hold its shape. And so one of the interesting things about this is you can now 3D print metals at room temperature in a way that's compatible with a, a variety of materials that would otherwise uh, not be possible. So in addition to stacking droplets, it's also possible to make wires. Here we just apply a burst of pressure, the metal shoots out, and it oxidizes so fast that it becomes stable. The resulting structures are deformable, they're stretchable because it's a liquid, and so we can make stretchable connections. And then finally, uh, the student who worked on this found a dead bug, and I promise you it was dead. <laughs> but just for fun, uh, gave this, this little guy uh, some extra appendages. And these, these don't actually have any function in this particular example, but they do show just how small these structures can be. And it also shows how gentle this process can be. It's, it's literally a room temperature process, and therefore we can now pattern metals with things like plastics. In addition to 3D printing the metal, one of the other ways to pattern it is to simply inject it. You can inject it into a small capillary. We call them microfluidic channels. You can inject them into fibers. And as an example, this, uh, of one of the very interesting things this allows you to do is you can make electronics that are stretchable, because here you're working with a very soft material. So we injected it into some hollow fibers made with our textile school. And uh, as you see in this video, we can play music, the uh, maybe familiar NC State fight song. And uh, as you, you may have noticed, as we stretch these fibers, the quality of the music does not change, nor does the, the volume. And so as far as I know, this represents sort of the best in class in terms of stretchability and conductivity. And what this does is breaks a long-standing trade-off that you find with composites. Typically, let's say you take a rubber band and you start adding metal to it, you might increase the con electrical conductivity, but you decrease the mechanical performance. You basically make it stiffer. Here we have sort of the best of both worlds. We have metallic conductivity while it has rubber band-like properties. And so we were expecting some cynics, and so we intentionally cut off one of the headphones, which is just resting over here, so that all the sound would be coming out of the one that we were stretching. So this is, uh, this is one of several approaches to making electronics stretchable, and this is going to be something that we're going to be seeing more and more in the future. In addition to being stretchable, one of the other interesting things that this material allows you to do is to make self-healing circuits. And so here we just took a, a simple circuit. It's a battery connected to an LED through a, a wire uh, made out of liquid metal. And we come in with scissors, and we cut this thing entirely in half. So we mechanically break it, and of course we electrically break it as well. 
It's a little bit difficult to see, but you may notice that the metal did not squirt out, nor did it withdraw into these little tubes. And so the point is that it oxidizes so fast that it's flush with that interface, such that when you contact these interfaces, the light comes back on. So we've now electrically healed it. There's also an aspect to this work which enables mechanical healing. And this is a, a polymer developed by a group in France in 2008. And it uses hydrogen bonds to hold together this material. And so if you wait about 10 minutes, you don't have to do anything. You just wait at room temperature. Those bonds will reform such that when you come back and pull on it again, it retains its original mechanical modulus, its mechanical properties. And so it's self-healing mechanically and electrically. And so you can think about this as, as a mechanism for durability, but also as a way to rewire things on the fly using nothing more than scissors. So I, I kind of tease you with this idea of the Terminator. And in a sense, I've demonstrated some of these principles that you know, we can actually pattern the metal. And you know, really, it's, it's, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, here are some of our mini Terminators. Uh, <laughs> these look sort of like Russian dolls. And you can see that they're, they're quite small and, and not very scary, so uh, the world can sleep easy uh, for a while. But, but it's really this property of the Terminator, the fact that it can reconfigure its shape that we're interested in. And this oxide that forms on this metal is really a blessing and a curse. It allows us to shape the metal into these interesting structures, but it also holds the structure in place. And so we sought a way to basically remove it and deposit on demand so we can control the shape on demand. And we use a very simple idea, which is electrochemistry. Here we've got a, a puddle of the metal, and again, it's not beaded up. It's sitting in electrolyte, which is just salt water. And we apply a very small voltage. That voltage acts a little bit like acid in the sense that it removes the oxide layer. We call this a reduction reaction, which is the opposite of oxidation. So all we're doing is removing that thin crust that forms on top of this metal. In the absence of that crust, the metal returns to a state of high surface tension, and it beads right up. So this is kind of interesting because we can now use it to control the shape and turn on and off so-called capillary behavior. Basically, capillary behavior is the tendency of fluids to adopt a shape that minimizes their surface energy. So as a kind of a, an interesting application, we created a maze of liquid metal. These are called microfluidic channels. Each one of these little wires is about the size of a human hair, and we've filled it with the metal. You may notice uh, down at the bottom, there's a droplet of the metal. This is the outlet to the maze. And at the top, there's a drop of water. And we're going to apply a voltage between there and remove the oxide layer locally. Now, usually I like to quiz my audience and see who is smarter than liquid metal and who can solve this maze. But let's see if the liquid metal can do it uh, itself. So we apply a voltage. The metal starts to withdraw because it wants to beat up over here. And there's a couple of interesting things. First of all, we can withdraw the metal cleanly without leaving any residue. It also follows the shortest electrical path, so it, it does solve the maze. And it allows us to reconfigure this uh, circuit, which this particular one is just for demonstration purposes. But it also leaves behind the metal that's not in the electrical path. And so this is a very simple way to use a very small voltage uh, that you could use uh, basically with a battery, about a volt, and to change the shape of the metal. Now, this is all very well and good, but we can only get the metal to go one direction, which is to go out. And so you may be thinking, well, why not apply, a, a switch the voltage, switch it to a different polarity, make it positive instead of negative. And that's actually a very good idea, except that all that would do is reform this oxide shell and cause it to, to stop. And so um, to our surprise, about two years ago, we made a discovery. And in this experiment, we have a drop of the metal sitting on the end of a syringe needle, and it's sitting in electrolyte, and this is kind of a key detail. We're going to apply a voltage to the metal, a positive voltage. And as you will see, when we apply the positive voltage, the metal spreads like a pancake. Now, what you, you may not appreciate here is that these liquid metals have enormous surface tensions, about 10 times the surface tension of water. And this is why if you've ever had the misfortune of breaking a mercury thermometer, you'll find that the mercury always forms little droplets and is very difficult to clean up. So here we have basically two forces. There's gravity, which wants this thing to be flat, and surface tension, which wants it to be perfectly round. And so you can imagine here, the implication is if it's spreading, the surface tension must somehow magically be lowering. And so we spent a, a few years trying to study this, and I'm going to basically show you in 30 seconds what's taken us two or three years to, to understand. Uh, but, the, but the beauty here is that we can use voltage 
to uh, basically move this metal around. So if we use a negative voltage, we can remove the oxide layer and it will beat up. This puts the metal in a state of high surface tension and it wants to be spherical. If we apply a positive voltage, we deposit the oxide layer and we find that it spreads like a pancake. And we can actually do kind of everything in between. The reason that it spreads like a pancake is actually quite simple. We believe that the oxide layer is acting like a surfactant. And a surfactant is, is sort of a fancy uh, jargon type word, but we all have experience with surfactants. If you washed your hair this morning or hopefully washed your hands. Um, and so a surfactant is a molecule that is a little bit confused. One end of the molecule likes oil, one end likes water. And so if you have two, two familiar fluids that don't like each other, like oil and water, and you put a surfactant in it, that allows you to distribute the oil into the water or vice versa. And we see these, these principles used in mayonnaise and milk, for example. Now one of the problems here is once you put the soap in the water, how do you get it back out? Well, there's ways to do it, but it's not easy. And so that's the beauty here, is that we've created a very simple way to put a surfactant on this liquid metal and cause it to spread, and then switching the voltage and having it go back. We can do this with plus or minus one volt, and we can get, basically, we believe, the biggest change in surface tension ever reported. And so this allows us to do some really interesting things. I'll show you a couple examples. Here we've got a, uh, the liquid metal sitting in a, a recessed uh, reservoir. And we're going to apply a voltage between the metal and a counter electrode. And you'll see that the metal indeed spreads. So this is starting to look like the terminator. We can put the, uh, the electrode on the left. We can get the metal to turn to the left. We can then put it on the right. And we can get the metal to turn to the right. And so this is, again, starting to look a little bit like the terminator. But again, we're at very small length scales. So no, no reason to lose sleep yet either. In addition, uh, one of the most interesting things, but perhaps the least practical of the stuff that we've done here, is this idea of the drippy faucet. If you've ever had a drippy faucet, basically there's two forces. There's gravity, which wants to pull droplets down, and there's surface tension, which holds the drop onto the end of your faucet. We've intentionally here created a drippy faucet by taking a tube and pumping the metal. And so when I start this video, you'll see that the metal, due to the forces of gravity, will fall into this electrolyte. But as soon as we apply a voltage, the surface tension goes to zero, and there's no longer a drop. There's only gravity, and it comes out as a perfect cylinder. And we've made these things as tall as a meter, and so they, it will stay stable. And so this is very interesting and just further proof that we're lowering the surface tension of this metal close to zero. And so one of the, uh, one of the other things you can do is control the shape of the metal. So here we put metal droplets over uh, reservoirs that have different shapes, stars, triangles, et cetera. Then when we switch from positive to negative voltage, we switch it back into a little droplet. So again, we're getting closer to the terminator. And you can imagine all the different applications that could take advantage of this, particularly electronics, such as antennas, connect, uh, sensors, connectors, that can change shape in response to very small voltages. And so hopefully, I've just given you a glimpse of the research that we've been doing at NC State. And one of the, the inspirations here that I hope you take away is that we've taken a material that's simply on the periodic table. We buy it. It's a material that people have known about since the late 1800s. And we've looked at this familiar material in a new way. And so that's what I hope that you can take away from here. We've taken something that's liquid and use it in a way that wouldn't seem possible with liquids. So I'd like to, to emphasize that all this work was done by a great group of students that I have the honor of mentoring. Uh, some of the students have graduated and don't appear in this most recent picture. Uh, but it's, it's a pleasure to work at NC State and work on such a fun topic. And I appreciate the invitation to be here, and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you for having me.